This year marks the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Argentinian Football Association. The trophy room in the headquarters in Buenos Aires bears witness to a glittering past. In a series of three reports starting this week, we look back at the history of Argentina's national obsession and trace its development to the present day. It all began back in the 1860s when British immigrants and sailors arrived in Buenos Aires. They brought with them a game hitherto unheard of in South America, football. It seemed quite improper to the local people at the time that men should run around kicking a ball in short trousers. It went against the good Catholic virtues instilled by their Spanish colonizers. But football, or soccer, held a special magic that the Argentinians could not ignore. And by 1867, the first organized matches were being played in Palermo Park. The man revered as the father of Argentinian soccer was a Scotsman, Alexander Watson Hutton. As headmaster of the English high school in Buenos Aires, he taught his pupils to play the game and went on to manage Alumni, the first major club and the best team in Argentina for 11 years. In 1906, Alumni beat a South African touring team, the first victory for South America against overseas opponents. A decade later, Argentina took part in the first ever South American Championship, organized in Buenos Aires against Brazil, Uruguay and Chile. Soccer was now well and truly established as a South American sport. 94-year-old Juan Scursoni is the oldest living Argentinian international. Of the 14 sports he practiced, soccer was always his great love. He remembers playing against Watson Hutton and Jorge Brown, the great stars of alumni, and also the difficulty he and his teammates had understanding the English soccer terms. Well, in those days, everyone knew that the first touch of the ball at the start of the game was called the kickoff, and that one player had to say to the other, are you ready? Well, we hadn't learned to say that in English, so we used to say it in Spanish. Estas listo. Then the other would reply, yes. Only we couldn't pronounce that either, so we'd say diez, which means ten in Spanish. <laughs> Internationally, during the 1920s and 30s, Uruguay were the strongest team in the world, but Argentina ran a close second. In the 1928 Olympics in Amsterdam, Argentina and Uruguay reached the final. Uruguay won 2-1. Two years later, in Montevideo, the teams met again, this time in the final of the first ever World Cup. Pancho Vareo was 19 at the time and the youngest member of the Argentinian lineup. I shouldn't by rights have been playing. I didn't make the semi final. Anyway, they tried me out for the final at the training ground to see if my knee was all right. I started kicking the ball about like there was no tomorrow. I just wanted to play. I was so young, I was just dying to play. People had sent me telegrams from home, letters from friends. Pancho, remember your old friends in such and such a place, in such and such a cafe. Pain in my knee? What pain? I couldn't feel a thing. When I went onto the pitch, it did start to hurt a bit. But I put on such a show. Carlito passed me the ball, and from 35 meters, I booted it to the goal. It hit the post. It was 3-1 at that point. Oh, my God, I remember that. The final score, 4-2 to Uruguay. The two Argentinian scorers, Guillermo Stabile and Carlos Pauchelli. 
Argentina had come mightily close to being the world's first champions. But a year later, soccer in Argentina changed forever with the introduction of professionalism. The first player to be sold, Carlos Pocelli, for the then phenomenal sum of 10,000 pesos. But once money became involved, the best players quickly realized there was more to be made outside Argentina, and many left for Italy. This, combined with an underlying Argentinian arrogance, they were the best in the world and they didn't have to win World Cups to prove it, meant that Argentina didn't compete seriously at World Cup level for another 28 years. But that didn't mean that exciting things weren't happening at home at club level. La Maquina, the machine, was the name given to the River Plate front line, comprising mythical names that any Argentinian soccer fan will recite by heart. Munoz, Moreno, Pedernera, La Bruna, and Lusto. They played 101 matches together and lost only 14. By then, Paucelli was coaching River to play an early version of total football, building up moves in midfield, organizing attacks from the back. It was the first time anything like this had been tried, and it worked. Jose Manuel Moreno arguably one of the best players the world has ever seen, was reputed to stay up all Saturday night drinking and playing cards, then go straight out onto the pitch on Sunday and play a brilliant game. Adolfo Pedernera played next to him on the pitch and drank next to him in the bars. We loved our nights out. We loved the girls. We loved anything and everything that broadened our horizons. And we could do it because we knew we had enough energy to handle it. In fact, our behavior wasn't to the detriment of our game. It actually helped us to play better. It helped us a lot because we'd go out and have a good time and at the same time chat about our game. So that when we came out onto the pitch the next day, we'd already have a plan of action worked out and it always worked. The great Alfredo Di Stefano also played in La Machina in 1947. From 1931 to 1957, River Plate won the national championship 12 times. And as Argentina retook its place in the World Cup in 1958 in Sweden, Argentinian soccer was characterized by the Machina style. Confident of victory and with eight River Plate players on the team, the nation was horrified when Argentina were knocked out in the opening round. Against superior European defenses, their style was outmoded and ineffective. The team returned home in disgrace. It was time for a change. I had a team of real men, not a bunch of women, real men. Look out, refs. If you've got 22 Argentinians on the pitch, you're in for a rough ride. In the 1960s, soccer in Argentina became notoriously violent. Scenes like this, rarely seen by the world before, were now commonplace back home.
In the second in our series on the history of Argentina's most popular pastime, we look at this most controversial of issues and meet the people behind it. Certainly, Roma was completely boxed with Argentinians were frustrated at qualifying for two successive World Cups, only to lose in the opening rounds. This was 1962 in Chile when defeat by England put them out. He scored! Argentina travelled to England for the 1966 World Cup in the hope of becoming the new masters of soccer in the country which had introduced the sport to its shores. It wasn't a carefully crafted team, but the sum of talent, Atime, Onega and captain Antonio Ratin, coached by the disciplinarian Juan Colas Lorenzo, was a daunting prospect for any adversary. After beating Spain and Switzerland and holding West Germany to a draw in the opening rounds, Argentina met England in the quarter-finals, a match that will forever be remembered for one of the most unpleasant confrontations in the history of the World Cup. After Argentina's violent performance against the Germans, England were hardly surprised at the overzealous tackling of their opponents. The Argentinians, however, were surprised at the severity of the refereeing. Bobby Charlton was in the England team that day. Controversy raged, you know, I mean, um, Ratin, the, the captain, tried to manhandle the referee and, and tried to browbeat him, I think, and the referee got so fed up that he actually sent him off, which was, which was a catastrophe for Argentina, because he was their most influential player. And, and because of that, really, we went on to win. I, I think had he stayed on, we would have found it very difficult to beat Argentina. They were a strong, strong outfit. But Ratin believes their 1-0 defeat was a foregone conclusion. He alleges a conspiracy involving referees who didn't speak Spanish and deliberately favoured a host nation who, in the days before big TV revenues, needed to win to cover costs. No, no, no. No, no, Argentina could never have won the title. It was all a fix from the start, so that the host England would win. I'm sure of it. If they hadn't thrown me off, it would have been our goalkeeper who would have gone, or another of our players. No, we were never going to go through. There was too much against us. Alf Ramsey, the England manager, called the Argentinian team animals. But to Argentinian soccer players, this would appear to be more of a compliment than an insult. There's no point in getting worked up about it. It would have been worse if they called us chaste little angels, as good as gold, then I really would have been annoyed. But if they tell us we're animals, or we're handsome, or we're real men, then I'm happy. But in Argentina, anti-British passions were still running high about that match as they consolidated their status as the bad boys of soccer. In 1967, Racing Club became the first ever Argentinian team to win the World Club Championship. But the three-game series against Scotland Celtic will be remembered as much for its violence as for anything else. In the decisive game, four Celtic players and two from racing were sent off, five in one incident. On their return home, all the Scottish players were fined £200 each. The Racing Club players each received a car. Another club in the forefront of the controversy over violence was Estudiantes de la Plata. From humble origins in a Buenos Aires suburb and with little or no money to buy in big name players, Estudiantes won the Argentinian championship that same year. They went on to win the South American club championship for the next three seasons. And in 1968, they achieved the ultimate goal, winning the world club championship against England's Manchester United. But the dream was marred by some of the worst cases of soccer violence that the world had ever seen. It was events like these that eventually led to some European clubs boycotting the competition. In the 1969 World Club Championship, three Estudiantes players were jailed by presidential decree for their behaviour in the second leg as the Argentinians lost an ill-tempered match to Milan. Luis Artime played in Argentina's 1966 World Cup squad. He believes that there is a fear of losing, peculiar to the Argentinian game, that is the cause of the violence. 
There are teams in Europe, like in Italy, Rome or Milan. If they lose in their league and get relegated, it's no big deal. But here, going down a division is a huge crisis. So this obviously makes people more fanatical, more passionate, more aggressive, just because they're scared to lose. But Argentina's image in world soccer was to change, and in 1978, a decade didn't bring immediate glory for soccer in Argentina. They didn't qualify for the 1970 World Cup, and in 1974, they were knocked out in the opening rounds. But a newly acquired and hitherto uncharacteristic sense of fair play did not go unnoticed. It wasn't until 1978 that Argentina finally received the honour that had eluded them for so many years, to host the World Cup. It was a momentous event for all Argentinians, and they certainly laid on a special show. But the World Cup held far more than just sporting significance for the Argentinians, as leading scorer Mario Kempes remembers. In Argentina, it meant a lot to us in 1978, because at that time, politically, things weren't going well. The military were in power, and the people were suffering. The World Cup brought out the true character of the Argentinian people, and made them forget their suffering, and also made them forget that critical period of history that the country was going through at the time. One of the best matches of the tournament was also one of the most controversial. A bizarre penalty decision against French defender Tresor in the final seconds of the first half against Argentina came after 45 minutes of French pressure on the home goal. Captain Daniel Passarella scored to give his team the lead. With an hour gone, Michel Platini equalised for France. Yet 18 minutes from the end, Leopoldo Luque's long-range shot found the goal. Argentina had 1-2-1 and were through to the second round. To many, Argentina were playing splendid attacking soccer that delighted their fans. Yet again, rumours of malpractice overshadowed their achievements on the pitch, centering on the crucial second round match against Peru. First, it was claimed the Argentinian organisers made Brazil play Poland in the afternoon, allowing their team to play their match against Peru in the evening in order to have prior knowledge of exactly how many goals they would need to qualify for the final. Secondly, it was alleged the subsequent 6-0 rout of the Peruvians could be explained by the fact that the Peruvian goalkeeper, Quiroga, had been born in Argentina. He later claimed he'd been paid by the Argentinians to let in the minimum four goals they needed to qualify. Argentina found themselves in the final for the first time since 1930, and the atmosphere at the River Plate Stadium was something special. El público argentino había... The Argentinian public had made up a song that became famous later. It went, let's go Argentina, we're going to win. And we could hear it a thousand meters from the stadium. It made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end to hear the passion of that song. And when we finally came out of the tunnel and into the stadium, we couldn't see anything because the Argentinians were throwing the customary ticker tape. And there was so much in the air that the whole stadium was a mass of white. Their opponents, Holland, had lost the final in 1974. They were in no mood to finish second best again. It was the era of total football, and the world held its breath to see if the Dutch would finally be crowned champions. But in the first half, the Dutch defence was put under enormous pressure, and in the 38th minute, Mario Kempes put the host nation into the lead. With an hour gone, Naninga equalised for Holland.
The game went to extra time as Kempis struck again, beating three men to drive the ball past Youngblood. And five minutes from the end, Kempes opened up the Dutch once more. Bertoni scored. The result, 3-1 to Argentina. They'd finally done it. The World Cup was theirs. Last week in Transworld Sport, we looked at violence within the game of soccer in Argentina. This week in the last of our series, we investigate whether anything has changed much over the decade and ask what of Argentina's chances in world soccer in the future. We Argentinians, when we travel abroad, we suffer a lot. We suffer from the fact that our countrymen who left before us made a mess of things, and it's us who have to pay for it. So what I want to do is show the world that we're not all the same, and nobody's got the right to paint us all with the same brush and dub us all delinquents. There are delinquents in every country. When an Argentinian cares, he cares truly and deeply. Diego Armando Maradona was born in a shanty town on the outskirts of Buenos Aires in 1960. His father bought him a soccer ball for his third birthday, and he fell so in love with the game that he used to sleep with the ball beside him. I have two dreams. One is to play in the World Cup, the other is to win it. As a junior, he played for his local team, Los Cebolitas, and then moved on to Argentinos Juniors. At 16, he became Argentina's youngest ever international when he played against Hungary, more than a year before Argentina won the World Cup without him in 1978. He then captained Argentina to the World Youth Championship in Japan, won the title of South American Footballer of the Year in 1979 and 80, before being transferred to Boca Juniors, Argentina's largest and most successful club for almost $2 million. But it cost a world record fee of $8 million in 1982 for Barcelona to acquire his services. And in Spain, much was expected of him in the 1982 World Cup Finals, where he was appearing in his adopted home. Yet, although Maradona showed flashes of brilliance, his tournament ended with a sending off against Brazil. Perhaps it would be harder to shake off the label of delinquent than he'd originally thought. Maradona was becoming the most famous player in the world, as he first helped Barcelona and then Napoli in Italy to domestic cup triumphs. But what he achieved for his beloved homeland in 1986 was the most outstanding of all, as Argentina's coach recalls. Argentina was a great team in 86. They worked well as a team. And on top of that, there was one player, Maradona, who became the number one player of the tournament. Before the World Cup, everyone, us, the journalists, were talking about who was going to be the star of 86. Would it be Francescoli, Rummenigge, Hugo Sanchez, Platini or Maradona? In Argentina, we all knew that Maradona was good enough to come out on top. And they were right. The name Diego Maradona has become synonymous with the 1986 World Cup, both for his genius in scoring some of the greatest goals ever seen and one that was not so great. 
But in 1986, Argentina also had an outstanding team, and they took their rightful place in the World Cup final against West Germany in the high altitude and sweltering heat of Mexico City. Enrique, Enrique, toca de Enrique. Estamos adentro. Se va Valdano, se va Valdano, se va Valdano, se va Valdano. Le pega Valdano, gol. Gol. De Argentina. Viene centro, centro fuerte para el cabezazo. Ahí llegó, el cabezazo, remate, gol. Gol de Alemania, Rubenigue. A ver, viene centro fuerte, 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 fuerte para el despeje. Ahí quedó, golpe de cabeza, gol. Yo estoy buscando Maradona, toque de primera. Atención, se acaba Boruchaga, atención, se va Boruchaga. Se va, se va Boruchaga, se va solo, se va solo. Sí, le pega, le pega, gol. Gol. De Argentina, Boruchaga. It was 3-2, and Diego Maradona had led his country to soccer's greatest honor. Maradona and Argentina had reached their summit. Four years later, it was to be a different story. The Italian 90 final also matched Argentina with Germany, but this time Maradona and his team lacked both flair and discipline. The match steadily deteriorated as two Argentinian red cards were followed by a Maradona caution and a referee surrounded by blue shirts once again. It had an all-too-familiar feel about it. Since then, Argentinian soccer has continued to decline in many ways. Drugs have reared their ugly head, with both Maradona and Canigia receiving bans for cocaine use. At club level, the game today seems to be less about skill and more about violence than ever before. And no Argentinian club has won the Copa Libertadores since 1986. But it's not all doom and gloom. Institutions like the Boca Juniors training camp for young hopefuls ensure a steady flow of up-and-coming talent. The boys, who are often from poor families in the provinces, stay at the camp for three years, completely free of charge, and receive both their sporting and academic training there. The place is brimming with enthusiasm and pure love of soccer, and it's not so hard to imagine another Maradona emerging sooner rather than later. One such hopeful is Gabriel Espinosa. When you're born, you come into this world to play soccer, full stop. Everything else is secondary. My real asset is my speed. Maradona's got the skill and I've got the speed. And if one day I ended up playing with Maradona, with him scoring as many goals as he does, we'd be a great attacking partnership. Argentina are also building a strong squad for the World Cup next year. They're unbeaten in 23 internationals since Italia 90 and triumphed in the last Copa America two years ago. Yet this success at national level may be a false dawn. The president of the Argentinian FA and vice president of FIFA sees a bleak future. If the economic powers that be leave open possibilities without providing safeguards and they take away your players, like in 1957 when the Italians took Mascio, Sivori and Angelio away from us, which ended up with our farcical performance in the 1958 World Cup in Sweden, then I'll tell you who'll end up playing for Argentina. You, me, him, anybody. And that'll be the end of soccer in Argentina. So it seems that the same old problems keep plaguing Argentina. Plenty of natural talent, but not enough money to keep it in the country. All the flair and skill that they could want, but not enough discipline to channel it. But one way or the other, Argentinian soccer will continue to provide plenty of color and controversy for years to come. Die beiden Männer von La Coruña unter sich.
Luis Enrique. Und Argentinien im Konter über Simeone. Maradona. Ihm kommt entgegen, dass die Brasilianer ihn nicht man decken, sondern nur in der Zone. Bebeto. Carica. Zweiunddreißig Jahre alt. Das Manko der Brasilianer bisher der Abschluss. Im Mittelfeld schlagen sie zweifellos die feinere Klinge. Filigranarbeit. Aber der dreifache Weltmeister lässt sich durch die Zweikampfhärte, durch das energische Dazwischengehen der Argentinier in der Abwehr beeindrucken. Carica. Abseitsposition von Bebetu. Ganz links beim Kopfball von Rai in Abseitsposition. auf Simeone. Kanitscha. Und Kopfstoß. Das war die Chance zum 2 zu 0. Riesenmöglichkeit für Gabriel Battistuta. Sehr schöne Vorarbeit von Claudio Kanitscha. Die beste Aktion in den zweiten 45 Minuten. Hervorragend dieser Schwenk von Kanitscha vor Branku. Ja, und dann kommt Celio Silva nicht an Batistuta heran. Die 56. Minute der zweiten Halbzeit. Waldu. Branco.
Bebeto. Setzt da zum Schwalbenflug an. Als ihn Dario Franco stellt. Also der Unparteiische aus Uruguay schreckt auch nicht vor Gallionsfiguren zurück, wie vor Maradona. Das Reklamieren, das Protestieren bestraft er mit einer gelben Karte. Branco, ein Spezialist, ebenso wie Rai. in der ausverkauften Arena im Monumentalstadion der argentinischen Hauptstadt haben gutklassige, flotte erste 45 Minuten gesehen mit einem sehr gut aufgelegten Maradona, der trotz der etwas überflüssigen Funde Brillanz verbreiten konnte mit Pässen, mit Dribblings. Die Brasilianer individuell sicher ein ganz klein wenig Versierter, aber die Argentinier zweikampfstärker, dynamischer in der Abwehr. Mauro Silva mit der 5, mit der 3, Celio Silva. Einer von zwei Einheimischen. Ansonsten hat Brasilien hier in Buenos Aires neun Legionäre aufgeboten, unter anderem auch Waldo mit der 11, der früher bei Benfica Lissabon spielt. Und jetzt zur französischen Kolonie gehört. Wie lange hält Argentinien den Druck aus? Brasilien ist dann stark, wenn die Mannschaft über den rechten Flügel kommt, über Cafu. Waldo. Luis Enrique und Ausgleich. Ausgleich in der 60. Minute durch Luis Enrique, der in Paris spielt. Bodo Ilgner wird jetzt am ehesten nachfühlen können, nachvollziehen können, was Argentiniens Torwart fühlt. Aber der Ausgleich für die Brasilianer ist verdient. Ein Tor in der Entwicklung versehen mit dem Prädikat Weltklasse. Mustergültig in den Rücken der argentinischen Abwehr gespielt. Und so kommen die Brasilianer, die in der zweiten Halbzeit die stärkeren Feldanteile hatten, Verdient zum Ausgleich.
Cafu mit der 2 sehr begabt, muss aber trotzdem um die Reputation kämpfen. Mauro Silva harmoniert blendend mit Bebeto bei Deportivo La Coruña. So etwas wie letzter Mann. Celio Silva mit der 3 bei den Brasilianern. Und Maradona nutzt die Chance, dass er nicht mal gedeckt wird. Batistuta, Maradona. Auf Simeone. Barranco, Bebeto, drei zweifacher Torschütze beim Weltcup-Finale gegen Barcelona, per Kopf und per Freistoß, aber heute ein Schatten seiner selbst. Mit viel Beifall wird hier Kanicia verabschiedet. Mit der 16 kommt Acosta von dem Boca Juniors. Oder mit Ina Bello mit der 18, das könnte auch sein. Auswechslung auf beiden Seiten. Müller für Kareka. Und Acosta. <Sie> 82. Minute. Eine hochklassige Partie durchgehen. Aber was hier beide Mannschaften zeigen an Dribblings, an geradlinigen Aktionen über die Flügel, das ist schon Weltklasse. Wie viele Mannschaften möchten so spielen können wie diese beiden? In dem filigranen Ensemble ist er für das Grobe zuständig, Celio Silva. Er spielt bei Inter Porto Alegre. Gut sechs Minuten noch im Monumentalstadion von Buenos Aires. Bei diesem Thriller zwischen den Giganten Südamerikas, Argentinien und Brasilien. Obwohl es für beide in Anführung nur ein Testspiel ist, ging man hier von Anfang an forscht zur Sache. Vor den Augen des FIFA-Präsidenten, vor den Augen des FIFA-Generalsekretärs vor den Herren Avalanche und Blatter.
Der Staubsauger Mittelfeld bei den Brasilianern. Mauro Silva, Rai. Müller vom Weltpokalsieger San Paolo, der ja auch schon eine Visitenkarte abgegeben hat in Italien bei Torino. Cafu, hochtalentiert und gewitzt. Da hätten sich die Argentinier auch nicht wundern, brauchen, wenn sie hier einen Freistoß zugesprochen bekommen hätten. Das muss mindestens Geld geben für die raubeinige Attacke von Celio Silva. Dunga mit der 17, jetzt für Luis Enrique, für den Torschützen der Brasilianer ins Spiel gekommen. Dunga auch ein Italo-Legionär. Er spielt bei Pescara. Beide Mannschaften ja mit grundverschiedenen Stilarten. Die Argentinier beinhart, knüppelhart in der Abwehr. Zweikampf entschlossen. Das behagt drei besonders nicht. Das behagt dem neuen Star mit der Nummer 10 absolut nicht. Die Brasilianer dann stark, wenn sie Raum haben, wenn ihnen Zeit gelassen wird, ihre Kunststücke zu zelebrieren. In dieser Schlussphase hat das Niveau nachgelassen, wird der Spielfluss mehr und mehr durch Zweikampfattacken unterbrochen, aber 62.000 sahen erstklassige, rassige, temposcharfe 45 Minuten. Franco konnte bisher noch nicht seine Freistoßqualitäten unter Beweis stellen. Dazu kam er wenig. 1 zu 1 durch Tore von Mancuso und von Enrique zwischen Argentinien und Brasilien. Anlässlich des 100-jährigen Bestehens des argentinischen Fußballverbandes. Und anlässlich der Auszeichnung von Maradona zum besten Spieler in der Geschichte Argentiniens. Offiziell ist die Schlussminute angebrochen. Und Abstoß vom Tor der Brasilianer.
Diego der Erste wollte hier einen Eckball herausholen. Wenn Diego Maradona heute vielleicht nur die Hälfte von dem gezeigt hat, was er auf seinem Höhepunkt in Mexiko zeigte, es war immer noch mehr, als die meisten anderen zu zeigen in der Lage waren. Ja, der Schiedsrichter lässt noch etwas nachspielen. Vielleicht noch eine Chance für den Gastgeber in den Schlusssekunden das 2 zu 1 zu erzielen. Bei dieser zweikampf karambolage hat Diego Simeone von Rai etwas abbekommen. Maradona, Simeone. Und können die Brasilianer noch mal zu einem Konterangriff kommen. Ganz stark auf der Rechtsverteidigerposition, praktisch auf der ganzen rechten Linie entlang. Verteidiger, Mittelfeldspieler und Stürmer in einer Person, der 22-jährige Cafu. Vom Weltpokalsieger San Paulo. Ein großartiges Talent. In der Anlage erinnert er zumindest ein wenig an Carlos Alberto, an den Kapitän der Weltmeistermannschaft von 1970. Das Spiel ist aus. Argentinien, Brasilien 1 zu 1. Die Torschützen Mancuso für Argentinien und Luis Enrique für Brasilien. Und natürlich am Ende umringt von Reportern, von Fotografen, der Star des Abends, Diego Armando Maradona.